Before you tackle that next writing project, listen to this episode of Content Marketing Engineered. I've brought on an expert technical content writer who shares his secrets for creating that perfect piece. And spoiler alert, it has a lot to do with a successful collaboration with subject matter experts. He gives lots of tips during the episode. You'll get a lot out of this that you can apply to that next writing project. Let's do this. Welcome to Content Marketing Engineered, your source for building trust and generating demand with technical content. Here is your host, Wendy Covey. Hi, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. On each episode, I'll break down an industry trend, challenge, or best practice in reaching technical audiences. You'll meet colleagues, friends, and clients of mine who will stop by to share their stories. And I hope that you leave each episode feeling inspired and ready to take action. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a brief shout out to my agency, True Marketing. True is a full service agency located in beautiful Austin, Texas, serving highly technical companies. For more information, visit truemarketing.com. And now on with our podcast. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Content Marketing Engineered. I'm joined today by Adam Kimmel. He's the Principal Technical Content Writer for ASK Consulting. Welcome to the show, Adam. Thanks, Wendy. Glad to be here. Glad to see you. We worked together for a a few years now, so it's so fun to have you on the show. And I can't wait to uh, first hear a little bit about your backstory, because... There's something I've never asked you, and I'm so excited to ask you here on the show. Okay. Okay. So I go to LinkedIn and I'm looking at all things Adam, right? And I see this bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, this master's degree in mechanical engineering. Okay. That's a lot of work, a lot of school. And here we are talking about writing for engineers. So, okay. What the heck, Adam? Uh, I think we need to hear the backstory of how you became a content writer. Yeah, and, and it's I get that question a lot because it isn't a typical path, which is sometimes the most fun, I think. Yeah. So I uh, I love engineering and technical things. Science and math were always a strength and a skill. And so I, I kind of became excited about climate change and helping the environment early in my life. And so this really led me to, you know, be wanting to become an engineer to help the environment. That's my personal overall mission. And so I worked for companies early in my career that made fuel cell products and, and things for alternative energy. Uh, the problem with those is that they were new technologies and they were things that people didn't really understand. So I would develop something, show it to an executive and they would go, okay, uh, I, I know this is, they would think, you know, I know this is something, but I'm not really sure why or what to do with it. So they would try to explain that to their managers and then their customers and clients. And so through all those different translations, it got diluted and, and, you know, sometimes way off track of what the problem it actually solved. And so I, you know, I would get these requests. Well, can you can you give me three bullet points for what the heck this is? Not really, but okay. (laughs) So that was really when I tried to say, all right, well, here's this really complex topic. How do I boil this down to something that someone understands, you know, what it does who it helps and ultimately why i would buy it Mm -hmm. um and you know once i started to do that i I realized the power that writing and communication actually have and then you know the other part of it was we would try to patent some of these research inventions and the patent attorneys didn't understand either so i would have to write summaries you know so there's kind of the business executive summary and then there's sort of the technical patent office summary these things are very different uh, but they still communicate the same features of the same product so it's, you know, kind of leaning to one style to another uh, to see how to explain these great inventions that, that we created. So that, that's really what sparked my interest in writing. Um, and it was kind of a way to, to accelerate and, and highlight some of the technical solutions that I found. Yeah, I find that so interesting because not every engineer can... Uh, let's say, keep themselves from diving way deep into details um, and forget about these audience personas, perhaps, that you're trying to educate with your material. So having the ability to appreciate who that audience is and what level of a technical detail is appropriate, is um, that's, a, that's a really amazing skill, <laughs> a needed skill in this industry. 
It, it is, and it, it also helps to kind of know how those audiences get their content because, you know, often if you have a business or non-technical audience, they're not going to dive into a white paper right away, first of all. And so yeah. it's understanding, well, how do you excite this person about a technology they don't understand? And so understanding what motivates them, what is their background, and, you know, what do you want them to take away? And maybe really what conversation do you want them to have next about your product? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if they're reading, you know, in a, in a, you know, a technical journal or something, they'll want to engage their engineering people really quickly. If they're just looking at LinkedIn, that style might be very different. And so it's knowing where they go for content and how they, you know, how they get to the information they want. Uh, I think that kind of guides the way we write. This is so dreamy hearing a writer appreciate the full buyer's journey and the marketing <laughs> context around how yeah. that piece will be used. So I love that. Uh, well, tell me what industries do you enjoy writing for and why? Well, you know, as I kind of highlighted, the environment alternative energy is probably my favorite. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, this is a group of people that are so passionate. I mean, anybody that's really worked in this industry for any amount of time, you hear that passion come out. You hear the urgency around what they're doing, uh, the excitement around what the options could be. Uh, you know, so anytime someone's excited, it's fun to write in that industry. I mean, that the passion mm -hmm. just comes out and it, then I just become a conduit. How do I get overflow this passion, you know, to get the audience as excited as the person I'm writing uh, you know, for. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, electric vehicles and automotive, I mean, I worked in this industry for over, I don't know, 13 or 15 years. Um, there's so much disruption with electrification and through all the craziness of the last two, two years, autonomous vehicles are still, still there. You don't hear about them as much because of all the noise, but there's still all this you know, oh, yeah. momentum around autonomous vehicles and the Absolutely. benefits that they can provide and now connecting them to smart cities and things. So, you know, so certainly technology in all forms I love to write about. So IoT, 5G. Um, another one that I'm finding is the manufacturing industry. It's it's really, uh, they're coming along. The technology has has understood the value of content, you know, for a while. And I feel like manufacturing is the next one that's kind of waking up to, wow, this is really an opportunity for us. Let's you know, let's increase our efforts around this content to, to really explain some of these innovations. Now that we have IoT, um, you know, how can we just improve industrial automation and tie it to, to supply chain, you know, friendly things? I mean, so manufacturing is another one, product development. And, you know, that I spent my whole career in product development. So I love writing about, you know, how do you get the product cycle uh, quicker, you know, how do you have supply resiliency in case of a global pandemic or something? Oh, what that's a hot topic right now. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, and then really um, chemical processing and, and uh, healthcare IT are the other two that I love writing about. Okay. Just because of how they're really technical and good solutions tend to, to be, um, I don't know, the people that understand what the solutions are, are really excited about those. And so yeah. the, those are kind of the six that I love writing about. Those are good ones. And and I agree what you said about manufacturing, just waking up to digital marketing and content-based marketing. It's, it's so interesting because we'll work with, you know, components companies, for example, and, or electronics companies, and they get it, you know, they're, they're further ahead. And then over in the manufacturing world, uh, you know, you touched on IoT or IIoT, and it mm. seems like that heightened sophistication of technology coming into the plant for it's like, okay, we're we're sophisticated over here, but then our marketing still like, hey, <laughs> let's go to some trade shows, and uh, and then here COVID hit and caused this marketing disruption and the sales disruption, if you will. And yep. I think those laggards are finally like, oh, wait, this is actually working. My website's actually really important and I can gather leads on my website at a fraction of the cost. Let's do more of this. Let's explore more. So um, it's great. I think it's it's good um, career growth for us both. <laughs> Seeing this. Yeah, I mean, they kind of take a step back and breathe and go, all right, well, we know that, you know, we're, we're doing great work in the in the automation industry but our, our marketing is just it because it, it kind of overwhelms i think and so mm -hmm. they go i don't even know where to begin and so the pandemic wasn't an opportunity for them to step back kind of exhale and go all right we need to start talking about some of these critical initiatives and critical disruptions that are starting to take hold and so that i think that's what the reason that we've seen such acceleration there yeah good 
Well, when you're working with these technical companies, you know, one of the most important things is getting your, your messaging right, right? Your value proposition, your appeal to that buyer. What are some of the challenges you face in helping companies craft those value propositions? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't realize that this would be such an important part of, of what I do, but, you know, being a research engineer for, you know, most of two decades, it's, I take the research piece for granted, but what it does is, I mean, when you go to engineering school, you learn how to learn. And so once I learn about a new technology, the process I apply kind of naturally goes to, well, why is this any better than the other client I was so just what? working with? <laughs> yeah, the, the so what exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I think talking with the subject matter experts and understanding their perspective, they'll tell you why what they have is so so difficult and why it was and what were the biggest challenges they solved and why the technology is so good. What they struggle to do is contextualize where it fits. Ah. And so just some of the leading questions of, all right, well, what was the problem that you were trying to solve when you stumbled upon this invention? Because very often the, the initial problem isn't the one that they ended up solving the best. It's, you know, we tried to solve this, but found this along the way. Oh, wow, this is great and big. Let's go here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just kind of having them walk through that whole process and journey um, gets them thinking about where it fits. And they, they do have a chance to take a step back at those initial meetings and conversations with sales and marketing to go, what was the need that we were initially trying to, to address and, you know, and what, what do we have? Mm -hmm. And so once they understand where it fits, it's much easier to then understand what parts of the product or service that they've created to highlight it could because we know what the pain point is now. We understand, you know, where your customer or audience is, is struggling. And, you know, we can pull out the features that address those pain points versus the minutia of, yeah, this is real difficult to do, but not really impactful for your customer. It's just kind of good to know. And once you get to that point where they're asking you about how you went through it and what was all the low level detail process, well, then then they're with you. But it's just getting that first pain point addressed that I think is the key thing. And so the value prop is understanding where, where things fit. Yeah. Who do you usually have in the room for those discussions? I mean, for me, I'm, I'm the most comfortable speaking with engineers. Um, so when I work with marketers often, you know, like with, with our partnership and either others, like there's an agency contact, a marketer who sometimes likes to be very into the details, sometimes likes to be more hands off. So it'll typically be me and the SME, there might be an executive and a marketer, but very quickly the discussion goes to technical to technical mm -hmm. and the business people kind of sit and, and realize they want to be there to hear and it's usually recorded, <laughs> but um, it, it's typically peer to peer. And I think mm -hmm. the benefit with being an engineer is that I know how to talk to engineers to get them to, to open up. If you come, come in as a marketer, it's kind of, there's an apprehension because, you know, historically engineers were always a little bit nervous about why is marketing in here? Are they auditing me? Are they, you know, <laughs> getting into the weeds of what I've done here? Yeah. What's me? really going on? <laughs> yeah. Whereas, you know, for me, it's kind of, I can, I can draw on a similar experience and go, this is what I saw in work I've done. Like, well, this is similar. Can you tell me more about that? Then they're at ease. They don't get as defensive, you know. I swear there's no conspiracy here. I just right. want to create a case study. <laughs> well, it, it is. And I think once once that, you know, bridge has been crossed, then they're much more helpful and collaborative. And it's usually in the noise between the questions you ask that the magic can be found. And and so once their guard is down and they're, they're open, um, that's, I think, when you really get an impactful piece of content out of it. Great. I mean, those subject matter experts, sometimes not only are they skeptical or wary of marketing, but they're not really excited about collaborating on a writing project, right? They're maybe not good writers or the whole process is uncomfortable. So, you know, any tips for people out there that are approaching that subject matter expert interview and wanting to just have it go well? I think the worst thing that you can do is hand them a pen and go, you write this and then I'll tweak it. Oh, That's yeah. never going to work because what they'll do, like in the case of me, when I started writing, I kind of said, well, I wrote a 200 page thesis. I wrote a, I was published in a few technical journals. I'll, I'll, that's how to write. So I, I yeah, go there. I got so it. then it's like, 
you know, the, the point of a master's thesis, as I found quickly, was how many syllables can I shove into every word in this title? Well, nobody wants to. Even the people that are on the committee don't understand what the heck anybody's talking about with those things. And so if it's even if there's low level technical experts, uh, there's only a small number of people, you know, that that can do it. So what I would what I would offer is even if you want them to write down some preliminary thoughts or bullet points, um, really get to what is the goal of all of this and and you know where does this fit and then let them know that let them know how their input's going to be used um, one again to make them at ease but then two so that they highlight the right parts um, you know getting data from them i mean engineers love data but i think one of the things that people miss you know with, with technical audiences is that that's all they want i think they need to understand why they should care about the data they see Versus, I mean, if you just blast them with with graphs and data without any context, I mean, we're we're not machines; we're human, right? So we want to know what am I reading and what is it helping? And so I think framing that data before you present it is is important. So getting the the most important data to tell that story it establishes credibility and authority, but it also helps the engineer speak the language he's used to, uh, and then understanding where it fits. So having them tell both sides of that before supplying this critical data, I think would be another one. Yeah, that's great. And then as the writer, you've already mentioned, you have the context of where this is going to be published or promoted. And so you're, you know, maybe being mindful of that, even if the subject matter expert doesn't need to know that information. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, you know, they, they often are curious um, uh -huh. because they want to they want to make sure they don't say too much. Uh, and so the other thing is, you know, yeah. if there's something proprietary, I think level setting. OK, here's where it's going to be. Is there anything I should be careful about? Is there anything I want to make sure not to say? Is there an NDA that needs to be discussed uh -huh. or in place? Or is there something that you want to go back and check with your legal team to make sure that we can say? And because the worst thing you can do is get into trouble with, you know, with some proprietary, um, you know, it, items or issues. You want to make sure that that's, you know, addressed up front uh, so that, again, the guard's down and then the technical people can talk freely. If there's too many guardrails around the discussion, nothing will come out of it because there'll be just yeah. too much trepidation. Um, so just framing up, you know, okay, where is it going to be used, but then where are the don't touch zones <laughs> of the topic? Right. Yeah, good, good advice. Uh, w one other one that I've heard quite a bit uh, from some of our writers at True is don't ask stupid questions. You know, don't ask things you can find out yourself ahead of time. So in other words, come in prepared, read up on the subject. You know, if there's anything that's been published in the past by this company on this, um, just just don't ask things you can find out on your own. Be resourceful ahead of time. And I could see where that would be really annoying uh, to have somebody, <laughs> the interviewer, come in cold, not understanding yeah. the subject, asking really just, um, you know, remedial questions about the subject. So, Well, especially if it's an authority piece. I think the type of content really matters in that context, too, because what engineers, what I found engineers do appreciate is, you know, for a topic they're familiar with, but not expert level, which is most things, yeah. uh, you know, they, they do appreciate a little bit of a reground on some definitions. So, you know, I think you could come in with this is my understanding of like the high level definition of what this is. Is this right? And, you know, I'd like to just reground the audience on this topic. You can assume everyone reading it knows exactly what it is, but more often than not, they don't and they appreciate you know, being acknowledged as a technical person so that you're not walking through it in such painstaking detail that you can't even stand to read it anymore. Yeah. But they do appreciate just kind of a little reminder and a reinforcement of, okay, this is really what we're talking about. And then we get into the, the lower level. So, uh, but there is a balance because you don't want to come up, you don't want to come in too remedial, but just acknowledging and, and, and sort of, I don't know, giving them the authority on the topic and not coming in as a as a peer necessarily letting them understand where you are and where your understanding is and um you know how they can help i think is important good good well obviously the subject matter expert is central to creating good technical meaty technical pieces tell me about if you can think of one uh, a project that maybe went sideways on you <laughs> Well, you know, like a lot of technologies, the subject matter expert, and usually the name that's on the patent, if that exists, is 
the most passionate person about the technology. And so where I've struggled is if there's too much micromanagement or oversight or involvement in the writing process. And, you know, so I learned very, very early on that I need to say, please combine your revisions between all stakeholders mm -hmm. and how about two rounds of revisions there because you go. when I didn't do that I was I was to <laughs> the about page of a website so mm -hmm. I was writing copy for this company that had a really really cool rapid prototype manufacturing solution so they had a really nice platform where you go on there you can pick the features and design the part just online with an internet connection order the part and it comes to you it's really really it was like Amazon for product development super cool so we had the the hard pages I thought went really smoothly and I was excited and so then the last thing was to write the about page and it took me seven revisions and it, oh. it, you know I don't even know how many weeks of, of time to get everyone's opinion and the worst of it was the arguments within the company in the comments section of my document so they were arguing with each other not aligned on what the about section yeah. should say as part of the third revision or something. And so I, um, that was a lesson learned. And so I always make sure to let, let, you know, let's, before we even write any words down, let's go get everybody together with combined revisions and let's just do it twice. You know, yes. if you can have more, but let's talk about scope then. <laughs> and one person will be responsible for reconciling all of those edits, <laughs> making sure it's, yeah, that, that has the authority to make those decisions. Yeah, that's a really good one. I, 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 <laughs> That's happened before, right? I mean, yeah. Oh. yeah. Well, for those listening or watching that are about to tackle their next writing piece, whether that be a white paper or an about us page, uh, what advice do you have for them? Really understand where you fit in the world, honestly. Um, not everybody can be the number one in what they do. So, you know, I get a lot of, well, we have the best service and we provide the best customer support. And, the best, the very and, best, Adam. I mean, it's we like it, it's like all these signs of number one, we watched Elf a few weeks ago and had Christmas in July and, you know, number one, number one world's best cup of coffee or something. I'm like, come on, everybody can be number one. So, I mean, really, if the writer knows where you actually are and who your main competitors are, they can help with researching some of the things that, okay, maybe they do better than you at some things, but there's got to be some things that you're advantaged in, and those are the things to highlight and, and, and make sure that the audience understands are critically important. So really having an honest view of the competitive landscape. Uh, and then also, what action do you want the reader to take? It's amazing to me that we get to the end of a really, really fun piece and you know, we come to the CTA, like the last sentence. It's like, well, what do you want? What do you what's what, what do you want them to do, do next? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if if the conversation stops there, then you're in trouble. And so I think, you know, in addition to telling them what you want them to do next, making sure the content is at least there's some counterpoint to be seen. Like mm -hmm. if you make a very generic vanilla point that's almost impossible to disagree with or have another opinion, there's no conversation to be had. So the goal typically is engagement. You want to get to the next conversation or a request for the next piece of content. Don't accept, you know, content projects that stop a conversation. You want things that promote engagement in a conversation and tell them what you want them to do or how you want the conversation to continue yeah. at the end of the piece. Okay, good advice. Well, how can people connect with you and uh, learn more about your services? So I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. So Adam-S-Kimmel is my LinkedIn uh, handle and the website is askconsultingsolutions.com. So it's a little bit to spell, but it's, uh, um, I've got a lot of updates there and my digital portfolio is there. And so there's, you know, my calendar and, and ways to connect you there. So Good. And it's Kimmel with two M's and one L. Is that Just like Jimmy, who there I'm not related go. to, but yeah. Thank that's bro. The, yeah. Hey, yeah. I'm not related to Stephen Covey either, but I get that question a lot. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> I always just say, sure, I'm his cousin. And they go, yeah. really? No. Come on. <laughs> no. Come on. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Great discussion. Have a good day. Thanks for joining me today on Content Marketing Engineered. 
For show notes, including links to resources, visit truemarketing.com slash podcast. While there, you can subscribe to our blog and our newsletter and order a copy of my book, Content Marketing Engineer. Also, I would love your reviews on this podcast. So please, when you get a chance, subscribe and leave me your review on your favorite podcast subscription platform. Thanks and have a great day.